Now, two of the many who interested ASIO here in Canberra were John Warhurst and Elizabeth Ward. John Warhurst is an adjunct professor of political science with the ANU and Flinders University and a columnist with the Canberra Times. He's also a leading light in the Republican movement and a member of the Labor Party. Known as Biff to her friends and colleagues, Elizabeth Ward is a writer who was heavily involved with the women's liberation and anti-war movements during the 60s and 70s. She's also a board member of Picking Up the Pieces, a group that raises awareness about post-traumatic stress disorder. Clearly, both of them potential enemies of the state. Adam Shirley risked his security clearance to spend some time with them. <laughs> Well, it came out of the blue, and I was actually talking to a journalist, um, Philip Dawling, uh, from the Canberra Times, and we were talking about something else, you know, just a, a, a general discussion about Australian politics, and uh, at the end of the talk, he said, by the way, do you know you've got a, an ASIO file? What, what was your initial reaction? Um, pretty surprised, I suppose, in that I've led a, a quiet life. Didn't think I would probably come to uh, ASIO's notice, as, a, as they say. Um, and as it turned out, it was uh, from academic activity rather than from any political activity. It was followed on from some research that I'd, I'd been doing. Although it wasn't until I saw the full file that I was able to recall um, just what the circumstances were at the time, you know, the Cold War days of the, of the 1970s and how an academic researcher could more or less stumble into the middle of it um, and inadvertently find themselves caught up in uh, uh, an alleged conspiracy about to expose the CIA in, in Australia. I hadn't even thought of the CIA. My uh, research had been about trade union politics and party politics in the mid-1950s at the time of the uh, Labor Party split uh, in Australia. And in doing that, I had begun to ask around a little bit to uh, see whether there were parallel activities uh, in other countries and uh, it never really came to anything but um, it was some inquiries I made which brought me to uh, attention uh, and the file details over about uh, the best part of a year in 1977 uh, just how ASIO sought to investigate me to see whether they uh, thought I was someone uh, who was involved in some sort of coordinated conspiracy and they did a certain amount of investigation of, of me and, uh, and of my family, uh, reporting on my father's reputation in Adelaide and uh, what one of my brothers had been up to in the anti-Vietnam uh, period, uh, war period, um, and my own activities. I was actually based in Warrnambool in Victoria at the time. They investigated immigration and customs records and found that I'd uh, taken an overseas trip in 1971 and listed where I'd gone to and um, boarding passes and all, all of that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a trip down memory lane in terms of your own history. You know, did I go there and did I go there? <laughs> Which is really quite interesting. For a pretty insignificant individual, there's obviously a lot of work, you know, work going into it. This is the stuff which came up from the inquiry with customs and immigration and it shows my boarding passes oh, and so on, travel, documents. travel documents from the from the time and they eventually came to the decision not to take the inquiry um, any further um, and I suppose it shows how there's a whole lot of mundane um, inquiries um, mun files which come to nothing um, which are generated um, perhaps at the slightest suspicion um, uh, at a time when people were really worried about these sorts of sorts of things, and um, you don't think you would come under uh, suspicion, so it's a it's quite a surprise when you learn that you have a little bit creepy, um, a little bit eerie, I think, to know that people are investigating you, um, but you know maybe that's just the way it is. I don't know. <laughs> always knew, well, since I was in my early 20s, that ASIO had a file on me, or probably did, and um, I knew that because I, I grew up with an awareness of ASIO having files on people because of my father's political involvement, and when I became very, very active quite suddenly at the age of 22 in the anti-war movement during the Vietnam War, 
Um, and I was connected with, the, I was in the group in Sydney who were the first to organise demonstrations and were organising them regularly and the numbers were growing and I just knew that of course we were being watched. So it goes back a very long time. When Women's Liberation started in 1970, so there was a period when I was very, still very involved in the anti-war movement and Women's Liberation started, but it didn't really occur to us in the same way that they would be concerned about women's liberation. And in fact, there's this huge file. And many of the sheets of paper have at the top subversive influence dash women's liberation movement. Um, and most of those records in my file are telephone transcripts. And they're transcripts of people talking about meetings and leaflets and you know, who's going to do what at the next get, time we get together. What's obvious is that they're looking for connections whenever a new name's mentioned. So if someone, my phone was the contact phone for in the early women's liberation days. So someone rings up and says, I'm Jane Smith, um, I'm interested in women's liberation. In the report, they'll have a bracket, Jane Smith, and I'll have a bracket, you know, phone number, who's this? You know, they're trying to identify people. They leave out the phone calls where we're just organising our own picnic or talking to the in-laws, but anything to do with women's liberation is there. Mm. And so the same names which they do in caps and brackets of their file number, you know, it's gone over and over and over mm. again. There's a few things that, about it that are unnerving. One is um, that, well, A, the taxpayers' money is spent. I mean, in those days, it's, you look at these this five-inch high pile of stuff in one of my files and you go, somebody, we paid public servants to sit and type this on old-fashioned typewriters probably with four or five carbon copies, like... This is labour-intensive. Transcribing takes a long time. Stopping the tape, starting it, however they did it. Like a huge amount of public money going into this. I was at um, the National Archives a couple of days ago saying, I want the photos, and because I don't have numbers of the photos, I can't say, I want this file, they're going, we don't know how to order this. We used to say, oh, look, there's ASIO taking photos. I mean, not, not a lot. We often probably missed most of them, but occasionally you'd see that at a rally or something. There's connections with an organisation at the time was called the Socialist Youth Alliance, where it's nearly the whole page is blacked out. Now, usually they black out the informers, but, you know, when the whole page is blacked out, you go, what, what is this? And there's um, a telegram about me booking a flight from Canberra to Sydney. Now, who, through TAA, you know, the old domestic airline, um, who sent that? How did they know that? Where, so it was this, like, a sense sometimes of things like that, that there were informers dotted around. Because it's so big and boring, I haven't even read through it all yet, but I'm planning to mm. in my retirement have a, a, more, a closer look and see if I want to do something with it. Mm.